Um, our next speaker is Dr. Saeed Mustafa Ali. He is a lecturer at the Computing Department of the Open University, um, whose academic research focuses on investigating issues at the um, intersection of critical race theory and decolonial studies and computing. Um, Dr. Ali has been investigating white supremacy, uh, racism, as a global systematic, um, systemic um, phenomenon over a decade. Um, and has facilitated a number of workshops and other events in this regard. He hosts the um, uh, <coughs> Dang Dang 2 blog um, and is one of the coordinators of um, SOAS2 um, initiative which ran two year uh, long fortnightly courses um, in counter-racism um, commencing in September 2013. <coughs> Dr. Ali, um, whose research interests also in include Quranic studies and critical um, Islamist um, thought presented a, a three-day short course entitled um, Towards an Islamic Decoloniality at the Euro-Arabic uh, Euro -Arab Foundation in Granada, Spain um, in April 2014 and at the Ibn um, Khaladun Institute of Social Services the Sciences um, in Kerala, um, India in December 2015. I welcome Dr. Said Mustafa's contribution. Okay, thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I hope I can get this finished in 10 minutes. Unlikely, but let's try. Bismillah. According to the German existentialist philosopher Martin Heidegger, a controversial figure for a number of reasons, not least of which was his early support for National Socialism in wartime Germany. Questioning is the piety of thinking. I am inclined to think that Heidegger is correct, and want to begin by asking some questions about the decolonization of the Caliphate. To begin with, has the Caliphate, whatever that term means, been colonized? If so, when and where did this take place? How and why did this happen? And who was responsible? What does colonization mean in the context of the caliphate? And in relation to decolonization, is this something done to or done by the caliphate? That is, should we engage with the caliphate as decolonized or as decolonizer? By way of offering some brief and tentative answers to these questions, and with a view to establishing the basis for some proposals, which I will present later, I want to state the following. If we are serious about enhancing possibilities for agency, autonomy and self-transformation in and of the Muslim collective, I think we need to view the caliphate both as decolonizer and as decolonized. However, in order to do this, I suggest we need to distinguish two senses of the caliphate. One, the caliphate as a horizontal social contract between human beings, and two, the caliphate as a vertical personal contract between the human being and God, or Allah. I maintain further that while both senses of the caliphate appeal to the prophetic phenomenon, the former views it as a post-prophetic, more specifically post-Muhammadan institution. The latter as a pre-prophetic existential orientation, i.e. the primordial and perennial Adamic condition. Put simply, albeit somewhat crudely, we need to distinguish between a historical caliphate and a metaphysical caliphate. And I want to draw attention to the fact that the Qur'an, arguably the founding text of Islam, makes no mention of the former, that is the institution, but does make explicit reference to the latter, that is the existential orientation. I also want to point to the tendency to marginalize or bracket the Qur'anic metaphysical caliphate from political theological discourse and praxis, a development that I believe has impacted negatively on the historical character of the institutional caliphate in terms of what I perceive as a deviation from normative Islam. In maintaining that the caliphate should be viewed both as decolonizer and as decolonized, I want to argue for the metaphysical the vertical, existential, or Adamic caliphate as decolonizer, and the historical, horizontal, 
institutional post-Muhammadan caliphate as decolonized, that is, the target of decolonization. I suggest that this is the correct way to proceed insofar as I take the Adamic orientation to be perennial, constant, perpetual, unlike the post-Muhammadan institution, which now belongs to the past, but possibly also to the future. Yet if we are engaging with the decolonization of the institutional caliphate, then surely we need to establish that it was colonized, what this means, when and where it happened, and who was responsible. In addition, there is the question of whether there was such a thing as the historical caliphate, that is, a single enduring institution, and if so, how long it lasted. I say this because, contrary to the myth of an unbroken caliphal line commencing with Abu Bakr and ending with the last Ottoman Sultan, Sheikh Usman Danfodio founded an independent Islamic caliphate in West Africa, the Sokoto Caliphate, during the Jihad of the Fulani War in 1809, to cite just one counterexample and a relatively recent one. The British abolished the Sokoto Caliphate in 1903, and Mustafa Kemal Atatürk abolished the Ottoman Caliphate on the 3rd of March 1924. And I would suggest that in both instances, abolition entailed colonization in the sense of an externally imposed transformation of these and other former Islamicate polities and their subsequent integration into a Eurocentric international order. However, following the Algerian sociologist Malik Ben Nebi, I think we need to ask what it was about these caliphates that rendered them externally colonizable. Is it possible that a prior internal colonization was at least partly responsible for this situation, one that might have occurred relatively early on in the historical or institutional <coughs> caliphate? In order to open up a space for reimagining rather than merely rebooting the institutional caliphate, I suggest the need to engage with the decolonization of the historical caliphate on two fronts, internal as well as external. By decolonization on the internal front, I mean that we need to consider the very real possibility that the caliphate was colonized in the pre-modern era in the sense of being co-opted and refocused as a colonial project, expansionist Islamicate imperialism. By decolonization on the external front, I mean that we need to consider the colonization of the caliphate in terms of the destruction of Islamicate power under the rising hegemony of an imperial system predicated on a binary involving exclusion, hierarchy, and naturalization. We can think about this in terms of the West and the rest, Europe and non-Europe, or if you like quite simply, global systemic racism or white supremacy. Most importantly, we need to consider to what extent any attempt made at thinking through the what and the how of decolonizing the caliphate in the post-colonial era is obstructed insofar as our thinking about the caliphate is at least partly filtered through what might be referred to as the lens of modernity, coloniality, or orientalism, a point that was made earlier. Now, having outlined my approach to thinking about the decolonization of the caliphate, I will now offer some tentative suggestions as to how this project might be realized. And I'll begin with some, if you like, metaphysical ideas. I want to begin by considering what it might mean to establish an institutional caliphate on a foundation other than the obviously legal or political. For example, and this might sound strange, on a mystical basis. In saying this, I want to challenge the assumption that mysticism, by which I really mean tasawwuf, and there is a difference, necessarily involves a preoccupation with the transcendent or vertical or otherworldly at the expense of this world and its imminent horizontal or, if you like, even secular concerns. On the contrary, I should like to argue that certain kinds of tasawwuf readily lend themselves to radical political action including that which can result in the formation of an institutional caliphate, rather than a political quietism, and that there are many historical precedents in this regard. While I don't have time to explore such a proposal here, even in its barest outline, 
I want to suggest that this is an area ripe for research. In terms of my own political thinking, I find myself drawn to the writings of Muhyiddin ibn Arabi insofar as his project is grounded in a serious engagement with the Qur'an as a living text. And it provides an important resource for decolonial thinking in terms of how to understand the Adamic Caliphate as decolonizer. In my opinion, the Qur'anic account of the metaphysical Caliphate, which, somewhat paradoxically, I consider to be both prehistorical but also transhistorical, has yet to be adequately engaged with in a political context in terms of the light it can shed on issues of power and domination. More specifically, I want to argue that this account provides a post-secular basis for understanding the origin and nature of supremacism per se, and that it can and should be used to inform what might be described as an Islamic decolonial orientation against both Muslim supremacist aspirations, whether of the ISIS or any other variety, and contemporary global white supremacy or systemic racism. With regard to the latter, I should like to state that I am convinced that the Qur'anic account of the Adamic Caliphate has something to tell us about the historical phenomenon of anti-blackness, and that it provides the basis for an for an alternative explanation of this phenomenon to that offered by seminal decolonial thinker and activist Franz Fanon. And now turning to the issue of the, uh, of the political, if you like, specifically the institutional caliphate. While concur concurring with the mainstream Muslim view that Medina is both the ideal and formative location from which to think about the historical caliphate, I want to draw attention to the fact that the Qur'an is silent on the matter of the institutional caliphate. And according to some commentators, this silence extends to the prophetic sunnah, although I appreciate that this view may be contested. If we understand the Medinan polity established by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a state, and the institutional caliphate as the continuation of this political formation, and yet, if the Qur'an and Sunnah are in fact silent on the issue of state, how should we interpret such silence? Insofar as Prophet himself established a polity, this would seem to point to the permissibility, or ibaha, of creating a state. But was the Medinan polity a state, and is the state a necessity? While the answer to these questions might appear to be a matter of definitions, I want to suggest otherwise. If we think about this issue in terms of the state and its relation to the secular religious divide, and I appreciate that this secular religious binary, if you like, is problematically applied in an Islamic context on account of its Eurocentric genealogy and relation to specifically Western Christian experience. Broadly speaking, I think we are confronted with four possibilities. Secular state, non-secular state, secular non-state, a non-secular non-state. If we follow the first proposal, does this mean that Islam and the state should be kept separate, with the institutional caliphate understood as a secular state in some sense, albeit one inspired by the religious and moral sentiments of Islam? Or, drawing upon arguments presented by Wa'il Halaq in the impossible state, is it that the institutional caliphate is neither secular nor a state, at least not in the modern centralized and monistic Weberian sense of the term, but rather a dawla. And by dawla, I mean a non-sovereign, non-territorial, temporary political arrangement that is accountable to and responsible for the whole ummah, not only to that portion of the ummah under its jurisdiction. Crucially, the actions of the dawla are, con are constrained by the sharia, which is both pluralistic and decentralized, in its production and application. While I am broadly sympathetic to Halak's position, I am interested in how it might be structurally modified in order to address certain concerns I have about authoritarianism and imperialism, both Islamicate and otherwise. To paraphrase and invert Orwell's famous line from Animal Farm, I am inclined to the view that while some empires are better than others, all empires are bad. 
some commentators have pointed to the need for the restoration of an Islamic great power. That person's on this panel, you have to guess who. As the means to effect Muslim redemption in the political sphere. Although I am weary about games of thrones and ages of empire, I am somewhat sympathetic to this view. What interests me, however, is how we might think about the nature of this great power, by which is meant its organizational structure and its normative orientation. For example, what if the prophetic and early caliphal conquests were in fact about shutting down mega machines, to borrow a phrase from Lewis Mumford? That is, dismantling imperial formations and preventing their re-emergence. What if the task of this great power is, in fact, to disperse political power, Islamicate and otherwise, such that the possibility of future mega machines arising, driven by imperialist, colonialist, authoritarian and supremacist motives, with aggrandizing power centralizing tendencies, <coughs> is reduced to a minimum. So much for the orientation of this institutional caliphate. What of its structure? Returning to the existential caliphate, I argue for maximizing freedom, autonomy, self-determination, agency, and pluralism, and for minimizing the role of government, if you like, a libertarian position of sorts. And I argue it is consistent with classical Islamic legal and political thinking, the suspension of which should be seen normatively as the exception rather than the rule. Incidentally, I think this raises interesting questions about where to cite the political, which I don't have time to engage here. However, what I will say is this. If we can accept decentralization and plurality in the FEP, why not accept decentralization <coughs> and plurality in the implementation of imara, governance? The Qur'an refers to ulul al-amr, that is, those, and it's those rather than the one, charged with governing. Why assume that this refers to a historical succession of individual governors or rulers, rather than a spatial plurality of sites of governance, self-organized in a bottom-up fashion, as some form of confederacy, what might be described as a radically decentralized, self-organizing, caliphal network. Crucially, I suggest that for such a network to come into being, and here's the, here's the problematic issue, I guess, it will be necessary to dismantle the existing world order. Not easy. In short, <laughs> In short, my take on the issue involves an attempt to rethink the meaning of the institutional caliphate by returning to Islam's founding text, the Qur'an, in order to establish a minimal set of guiding political constraints and commitments and de-sanctifying what I take to be an increasingly hagiographic, that is, sacralized, Islamic historical experience so as to be inspired by the past not shackled by it. In short, a respectful and selective engagement with our tradition. In closing and returning to Heidegger, I want to suggest that the decolonization of the caliphate is an opportunity, <coughs> arguably one prompted by necessity, to question decolonially and thereby think piously with a view to ending the world so that the earth and its people can mend. Thank you.